everyone. Um, today, my presentation is titled Nighttime Economy Governance, Conflicting Rationalities. My name is Alessia Chibin and I'm PhD candidate at the University of Technology, Sydney. Um, before starting, uh, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Orna nation upon whose ancestral lands University of Technology Sydney stands. I pay respect to the elders, both past and present. And I would also like to remember the legacy of Vanessa Watson, professor in urban planning and studies at the University of Cape Town, who passed away the last uh, August and from whom I borrow um, the concept of conflicting rationalities in my work. Um, so today's presentation is based on a peer review book chapter that I've recently published in the book Transforming Urban Nightlife and the Development of Smart Public Spaces and uh, on my ongoing PhD studies. Uh, um, I would like to acknowledge the fact that COVID-19 has impacted my research, not only from a topic point of view, um, in fact, a new focus of the research is the COVID-19 uh, impact on the nighttime economy, but also from a methodology, methodological point of view. Um, originally, I planned to conduct face-to-face uh, -face interviews and um, to participate as an observer to key stakeholders meetings, but I had to move um, all my data collection methods uh, online. Um, another impact of COVID-19 on the research was the exposure of the researcher and participants to this stressful situation due to COVID-19. Um, so I would like to start by talking about nighttime economy governance and by defining what are the policy models and the poli policy actors that have been characterizing the last two decades. Uh, all around the world. Um, in my book chapters, I basically proposed uh, a framework to understand what is nighttime economy governance. And uh, due to the fact that in the last decades, um, several nighttime economy specific stakeholders ray rise around the world, um, but there's no basically definitions around what are these models, what are, the, what are they about? and how can we define them. I basically identified six policy models, as you can see from the picture, uh, like for example, night mayors, night city managers, and all of them uh, contain, include the word night. Um, if we remove the word night from this policy model, we realize that these models are already existing. Um, in fact, if we engage with the literature on local government, public policy, grassroots movement, and so on and so forth, we realize that these um, models and actors already exist. The innovation here, as a recent study has demonstrated, um, is not only the trend of um, establishing these models in different global or middle-sized cities around the world, um, but they um, had an opportunity to establish an institutional forum for discussion around the urban night in uh, our contemporary cities. Um, in my view, uh, what a night mayor is uh, may not exist in the real world. And um, for example, night mayor uh, in my framework is a person who is elected representative maybe uh, in the local government, so in a city council, or uh, at the state level. The night city manager is also a government actor within um, the public administration and serve the purpose of elected representatives. Um, I define these models accordingly to the level of uh, formality um, and the informality and um, um, to the type of actors, if they are governmental or non-governmental actors. Um, 
while these are policy models who have adapted differently accordingly to different uh, political, social, cultural contexts in cities, they, I argue that they are also political actors and we can define them according to the type of interactions and to the locus of uh, authority within these uh, organizations. Um, for example, if we look at these schemes, at this slide, we realize that public-private partnership, in my view, um, are the most um, um, hybrid um, form of nighttime economy governance, while nighttime economy commissions um, um, display a more horizontal arrangement by um, advising the local or state government. Night mayors and night city managers uh, disclose a more top-down policy making mode, uh, while night, night lobby groups are more similar to nighttime commissions and night advocacy groups are um, disclose a bottom-up uh, way of policy making. Um, one thing that I would like to um, emphasize here is that in the case of night mayor and night managers, um, most of the power is concentrated in one single person. Although um, this way of understanding has been developed in order to uh, make this, key, this scheme uh, um, applicable to case studies, uh, in the real world, the situation of governing the nighttime economy is a bit more complex. Uh, for example, night mayors and night managers have been demonstrating being mediators around nighttime conflicts, um, but also they have to engage with different level of governments, from the lowest level of government, to the um, highest level of government, and then they have to engage with the external communities, both industry and residents. Um, um, one, I would like to share with you a quote um, that drew my attention in attending online talks during my PhD. Um, I was attending this talk uh, regarding lessons from the UK reopening nighttime industries. And one thing that uh, Michael Keel from Nighttime Industries Association, the UK, um, mentioned is that we didn't think to become a political machine, but we had to. Um, this supports somehow my way of thinking at um, forms of nighttime economy governance as political actors. Um, my starting point to develop my PhD and my way of thinking at nighttime economy governance is the adoption of the concept conflicting rationalities. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the concept has been developed by Vanessa Watson and one of his students in the planning uh, theory and literature in the global south. And the concept has been defined as the tensions uh, arises at the interface between the different and clashing logics or rationalities of various urban actors. And these reflect understandings derived from contested claims, meanings, and values. Um, by adopting this concept, we can refer to different modes of governance that I've just explained as competing and coexisting and often conflicting rationalities in the sense that if we look at them as politi political actors, they have different um, agendas and different priorities, and they have different political strategies to influence policy making. Um, on the other hand, we can think and use it the concept, but I will welcome any feedback from you, um, because I'm trying to engage with the concept and develop my theoretical framework with my PhD. Uh, thesis. Uh, um, so on the other hand, we can use the conflicting rationalities concept to, to explain different perspectives around the nighttime economy. And here is the case of Sydney that comes into play. Um, so 
basically during my PhD, uh, I'm targeting and I'm focusing on uh, six um, groups of relevant uh, political actors, such as residents, nighttime business owners, nightlife activists, parliamentarian and conciliars, government personnel, nighttime economy experts, and the police. Um, what I'm interested in is trying to understand what are their perspectives around the nighttime economy and how the nighttime economy has been regulate, regulated prior to and during COVID-19. Um, so not only their perspectives around the nighttime economy, what constitute problems, what constitute pro opportunities, but also what are their um, perspectives around how the nighttime economy is and was and should be regulated. Um, what I'm trying to do is, of course, under development, but as um, my first phase of data collection through semi-structured interviews uh, through, different, through these different cohorts of participants, um, has um, let emerge that of one key, sorry, one key focus of the research is uh, the impact of the local laws and how different perspectives display uh, or position them, how these different groups position themselves around the introduction and the relaxation of the local laws. If you look back at the past, we can identify two, um, uh, three events, let's say. Uh, one is back to the 2007 when the local council, the city of Sydney, um, has declared um, uh, King's Cross nightlife precinct in Sydney uh, an entertainment precinct. By doing so, um, a relaxation of light liquor and planning licenses occur. And by doing that, uh, the nightlife district in King's Cross has risen. Um, even though um, between 2007 and the introduction of the these restrictive regulations around liquor licensing, as Peta Wollifson explained yesterday in her presentation, um, the situation in King's Cross went totally out of control, as many interviews have um, stated and as you can read in the public media. Um, so what happened after the death of two young kids in King's Cross, the New South Wales uh, Liberal government introduced uh, the local laws. And uh, these, these restrictions have been eased uh, in uh, January 2020, just before COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so the effects of the relaxations of these um, uh, liquor amendment are not visible because of um, the COVID-19 pandemic restrictions, uh, but still the public debate and around, around the local close is uh, still lively in Sydney. And it is uh, nowadays and in the last couple of years that a kind of shift occurred in the nighttime economy governance here in Sydney. Um, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, in 2017, a night city manager has been appointed at the local government level in the um, City of Sydney Council uh, with the aim to implement um, um, uh, Sydney 2030 global strategy. Um, just recently, in March 2020, a 24-hour economy commissioner has been appointed in New South Wales. Although it may seem that um, the rise of the um, ad um, adoption of this policy model uh, may add a further layer of complexity, um, I argue that it had a layer of sophistication in nighttime economy governance that might be worth to be explored further. Um, by going back to the concept of conflicting rationalities and by sharing with you some of, um, um, some of the quotes from my participants, um, we can see, for example, that conflicting rationalities 
around the local clothes um, occur within and between different groups of participants. For example, as you can see here from an interview occurred with the residents in um, King's Cross Sports Point. Uh, the resident says we were big supporters of the lockouts. They we, we had a number of meetings with ministers, a number of meetings with the local council, with bureaucrats as well. And I've been to dozens and dozens of council meetings and the council would not listen to us. We went to consultation after consultation and they pretended to listen and they would not. While, um, as this interview show and confirm the results from the research of, um, by Peter Wollickson um, um, about uh, consult public consultations during the period of the local close. Um, another interview, um, a resident in Newtown, um, another nightlife precinct here in Sydney, argued that um, the local clothes were shocking, were absolutely shocking. Uh, not evidence-based, um, very damaging to a lot of unintended consequences, which comes out of having poor policy-making frameworks, too much authority to the police. Uh, really bad for live music, really bad for the arts, um, former effects to some other suburbs. So yeah, I'm, I, was, I was not a supporter of the local laws. So these conflicting ideas and positions between the same cohort of participants, residents is highly relevant to show um, the oppositions and supportive su supporters of this uh, nighttime economy policy. Um, here, for example, we have another position, another um, yeah, from um, a representative of the nighttime economy uh, sector, um, who argued that the debate around the nighttime economy in Sydney was limited back at the time of the local clothes and very focused around licensing, around alcohol, around the debates on the local clothes in, part in particular parts of Sydney. And here he refers to some uh, to um, Sydney CBD and um, Kings Cross Sports Point, who were the target area of these restrictive regulations. Um, but the participant here see the nighttime economy as an opportunity. Um, it's time, and it's time to talk about the nighttime economy in a much broader sense, and particularly the economic opportunities of having a more diverse nighttime sector. So what we really started that conversation with state governments and with businesses, and do we wanted to bring together a coalition of different parts of the nighttime economy ecosystem so that you, owners, providers, regulators, artists, and creatives, how we could use the nighttime economy to promote Sydney as a great place to live and work. Um, it's, oh sorry, uh, uh, it's evident here that um, um, a new narrative, this shows um, um, a new narrative occurring in Sydney around the nighttime economy, around the um, revitalizations of um, nightlife precincts, but also the effort to push and uh, Sydney in a global city um, um, network. Um, another thing from this interview that we can observe uh, is that if we think at um, po political actors, um, we can see that um, these participants or the nighttime economy sector in somehow um, didn't support the local clothes, but also tried in the last um, a few years uh, to build a coalitions around um, a new narrative of the nighttime economy. This also brought, um, th this was part of a huge effort of stakeholders engagement, but also an attempt to develop consensus around 
um, nighttime economy policies. Indeed, what um, has been recently um, launched in um, April, uh, March 2020, 2020 was a new strategy, the 24 hour economy strategies by New South Wales government. And this strategy was endorsed by um, and supported by um, a large um, coalitions and of uh, stakeholders. Well, I see. I'm um, really sorry to interrupt you. Just to let you know that uh, your time yeah, is up. I'm oh, done. Wrap up. <laughs> uh, these are the the next steps of my research, and I'm pleased to receive any comments um, about my project. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think we will have uh, a longer discussion at the end. Uh, so please, everyone, okay. prepare your questions and you can also share them on the chat. Uh, thank you. That was really insightful. Uh, so now we will move to a different part of the world, uh, namely uh, Vietnam. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm going to present for like five to 10 minutes. Um, and I'm sorry that my um, colleague is not here. Uh, actually, I don't know where he is right now. Uh, he's a, a dean, and you can imagine that he's very uh, busy. Uh, I'm not a dean, but um, so I'm here. Uh, and I'm being I'm Vietnamese, but I'm teaching in Japan, as you can see. Um, I'm in Kobe right now. But we are not going to talk about Kobe, but we are going to talk about Vietnam. And um, we try to explore the um, perceived impacts of a nighttime economy from the perspectives of um, uh, the local people. Uh, as we can, as we listen to the previous presentation from Alessia, we know that there are a lot of stakeholders uh, participating in the nighttime economy. But in this study, we only focus on one stakeholder, um, the uh, local residents in Vietnam. And uh, the reason why we chose this topic, because recently in recent years, uh, Vietnam is trying to diverse uh, the structure of its economy, and um, they are considering um, the um, use of nighttime economy as a new force for economic development. That's why we uh, chose to focus on this topic at the moment. So uh, the purpose of our study, uh, this step of the study, is to um, uh, examine the binary and multi-dimensional natures of perceived impacts of nighttime economy using a mixed method, uh, because we found that there are two huge uh, gaps in the literature regarding the um, uh, separation of the positive and negative uh, impacts of nighttime economy, as well as um, a missing understanding of the multi-dimensional nature of nighttime economy impacts. So uh, these are the reasons why we um, we are doing this research and uh, the purpose, as you, as you can see on the slide. Now we, uh, I'm going to explain more about um, the uh, our research. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about two um, sub studies. And this is about the first study. Uh, we content analyze uh, news readers' comments about the nighttime uh, economy initiative. And um, we collated uh, 538 comments um, from July 2019 to December 2020 we selected um, VN Express, uh, net, which is a um, very popular um, news site in Vietnam. And then we um, analyzed the comments and we came up with this list of perceived uh, impacts of um, nighttime economy um, from the perspective of Vietnamese uh, people. And uh, because the, the slides, the tables in the slide is quite small, so please let me uh, read some of the uh, impacts that we extracted from the reviews. For example, uh, regarding the positive impacts, uh, we have uh, to improve streets beauty, 
to satisfy nine dining needs, to satisfy nine entertainment needs, to maintain nighttime control identity, or to reduce daytime traffic. These are five of the positive impacts among the totality of 40 positive impacts. Uh, similarly, we found out uh, 40 different uh, negative impacts uh, perceived by Vietnamese local residents. I'm going to um, read five of them, uh, which, which are uh, to harm youth lifestyle, to harm local residents' lifestyle, uh, to harm residents' health, uh, to harm nighttime workers' health and to disrupt elderly people's lifestyle because we don't have a lot of time. And I think it would be very boring if I read all the uh, impacts that we uh, extracted from the comments. So I'm going to move to uh, the discussion of this part. Uh, through the analysis, uh, we um, found that the perceived impacts of a nighttime economy uh, have both the positive and the ne negative aspects, uh, which is a binary perception. Uh, the positive impacts include uh, the impacts regarding the economy, uh, social culture, environment, or infrastructure. Um, we also observe that um, there are smaller um, benefits in the economic benefit category, including uh, these regarding or concerning the patrons, the residents, the economy, and the businesses. Regarding the negative impacts, we also found uh, the perceived impacts regarding economic, uh, social, cultural, environmental, health, and administrative costs. And Again, um, the economic costs can be divided into uh, two subcategories of um, uh, cost to the economy and cost to the businesses. So in the uh, second study, we uh, used uh, these items um, in a quantitative study with 352 uh, people that we gathered um, in the um, social media platforms of um, the second researcher, the one who is missing uh, now. And uh, after that, we did an exploratory factor analysis to um, reveal the hidden structure of the perceived impacts of um, nighttime economy uh, in Vietnam. And here are the results. Uh, regarding the positive impacts, we extracted uh, three factors. And uh, the, um, regarding the uh, negative impacts, we uh, extracted four factors. And uh, more details will be explained right now. About the positive impacts, uh, the three factors uh, involve the, the economic benefits for businesses and customers, um, the um, environmental benefits, and the in economic benefits for local residents. And um, about the negative impacts, we have four um, factors of social cultural impacts, environmental impacts, health impacts, and economic impacts for businesses. So you can see that um, the impacts are multi-dimensionally structured and um, the, the, the components of the positive impacts and the negative impacts are different. So um, in conclusion for this presentation, I can say that uh, people in Vietnam perceived the impacts of nighttime economy um, from two perspectives, both the negative impacts and the positive impacts are uh, evaluated by the local residents. And within each type of impact, um, we have different components regarding the uh, economic benefits or costs, uh, the environmental be uh, benefits or costs, uh, and so on and so forth. So because this is uh, just a part, uh, the, the, the former part of our project, um, we will continue this project in the future, in the you know, next months, um, the, upcoming, uh, the upcoming months to confirm uh, the structure um, and then to compare the perception uh, of the impacts of different stakeholders. And uh, this brings me to the end of my um, presentation. And I think that the uh, discussion part or the question and answer part will uh, come later. 
So uh, I thank you again for listening to my presentation and I will wait for your questions at the end of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben, uh, and also very good time management. <laughs> uh, now we are uh, moving to Poland with Magdalena. Thank you very much uh, also for joining us. Uh, so you have the room. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to try to launch the presentation. And please, uh, if you could uh, confirm that you are uh, seeing it, uh, because I had the problems with. Yeah. It's uh, working. Is it the first slide? I mean, the slides. Uh, yeah, we don't see your notes. Yes, 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 that's <laughs> that's the point. <laughs> uh, sorry, th so thank you very much for having me today. Uh, my name is Magdalena Kumal-Czerwinska and I'm representing the Institute of Geography and Spatial Management at the Aguilena University in Krakow. And uh, I prepared this presentation, uh, I mean, the leader of the of the, of the topic is, is Robert, but uh, my colleague is uh, today since one week um, on a on a PhD a seminar with students in Kenya, so he cannot to join us even if he could. Uh, the technical problems are overwhelming there, so uh, I'm so sorry. I'm just going to be presenting here. I'm going to try also to answer all the questions. Uh, the topic of our presentation is uh, today devoted to uh, cities nightlife in COVID-19 era, especially in the Polish conditions. That's why we're going to have a small insight on uh, two major tourist cities in Krakow of a different background, so uh, of, of Poland, so with a different background. Uh, Krakow as a typical uh, uh, urban tourism uh, uh, destination, and the second one uh, will be Zakopane, a mountain resort. Uh, we're going to talk about how the nighttime economy uh, and tourism developed in the city in the post-COVID era, referring to the pre present uh, COVID pandemic situation and the closure of all tourist destinations in many cities, as well as nighttime economic facilities. Uh, we want to present, like give a small insight into changes that have occurred over the last year since the particular period of time, since March 2020 till March 2021. So uh, uh, the time which is very, uh, which was very, um, uh, 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 drastic for nighttime economy facilities in Krakow because of two lockdowns. Uh, we also want to have a, um, a small insight on reaction to that changes uh, from the demand point of view, as also from the point of view of entrepreneurs of nighttime economy activities, uh, nighttime economy uh, facilities. Uh, also, we would like to ref give a small insight on how the city authorities helped uh, um, nighttime economy uh, entrepreneurs to operate during that time. And uh, also would like to show a bit about the, like a small piece of opinions uh, from uh, which were derived from the uh, interviews with nighttime uh, uh, economy entrepreneurs, how they run and how they operated during that time. Uh, yes, uh, I will start my presentation with from sketching some uh, premises for the analysis. So the time frame uh, is uh, March 2020, March 2021. So in Poland, the period including two time periods where the current restrictions were shaped, introduced uh, as a first lockdown during the first wave of the pandemic and the period of national quarantine, which was called national quarantine during the second wave with, with much more powerful consequences for the economy and above all in the bigger number of the victims. The analysis uh, is dedicated and limited to nighttime economy and their main users in the range of activities shown in the above drug, uh, uh, diagram. The starting point uh, for the research was the analysis of the similarities and differences in the night economy, uh, nighttime economy of urban of urban tourist cities and in tour, uh, tourist resorts. So those two cities, we were trying to compare. The similarities include, among others, similar types of activity, the scale of the phenomenon, which depends on the size of the city, the main difference is in both cases, so Krakow and Zakopane are the recipients. In the city, in, a, in addition to tourists, in the tourism city, the internal users like residents are equally important. Tourist 
can shape uh, the development of time time economy in zones just spatially limited to the historical center so in Krakow and without going beyond these zones residents and students are offered other nighttime economy uh, zones in the city so this is very visible in Krakow in the case of tourist resort as Zakopane uh, they are uh, those recipients are mainly tourists out of season in many tourist resorts in Poland nighttime economy dies after the tourist season uh, so the assumption that in the modern leisure model the development, the development of nighttime economy is constant and that this sector will develop dynamically was put, put, put in the test during the COVID-19 pandemic. The crisis came, it was a shock event, and the question now is how the sector reacted in the pandemic and how its users behaved. We assume that nighttime economy is one of the sectors most affected by the pandemic, but, then, but luckily in Polish conditions, this is the sector that has shown the greatest resilience. Our speech, I mean, my, uh, my presentation will be devoted to uh, discuss this issue. Uh, I will try also to, in, uh, to include in the uh, discussion uh, the, uh, the moments, how quickly, quickly that nighttime economy uh, businesses return to operate during the night and how demand started to fulfill their needs during the night. Uh, so the aim is to just to reflect changes that had occurred over the last year from March 2020 to March 2021 in the sphere of nighttime economy in Poland. And two examples, Kraków, which is a center of urban tourism and Zakopane mountain tourist resort. I will try to, evaluate, I, I will try to uh, present you uh, four aspects, changes in the temporal availability of nighttime facilities in the context of legal restrictions and resistance to these restrictions, uh, changes in demand behavior. Attention will be especially paid on residents, students, and tourists, uh, especially on the behavior of young people and students uh, being in Krakow, living in Krakow. Uh, I will also try to, uh, uh, to, to show the reactivity of the society to the restrictions. Uh, um, I will try to present the review of activities aimed at the reopening of nighttime economy. And also I will try to present an overview of the city's government and cities, like uh, uh, Krakow and Zakopan, and governmental actions undertaken during this period to support nighttime economies and reception of those actions among uh, business owners. Uh, our research and observations of the nighttime economy market focus especially on two cities, Krakow and Zakopane. Those tourist cities uh, differ from each other significantly in terms of tourist traffic, type of tourist traffic, the number of tourist traffic, the, the number of tourists visiting, uh, visiting Krakow and Zakopane every year, uh, the size of tourist traffic, the size of, of uh, uh, accommodation base, and this, uh, the, 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 the biggest difference is also the function of those cities. Uh, although both cities are uh, placed on the south, uh, pa southern part of Poland in a totally different environment, uh, Krakow is a multifunctional city with the core of historic tourist city, which mm, always uh, attracts uh, mm, tourists every year. Uh, we have the numbers up to 14 million tourists a year. Zakopane is a different place. It's a different city. Uh, it is a mountain holiday resort, especially very populated during uh, winter and summer season, uh, also during uh, uh, longer weekends. Uh, Krakow um, uh, and Zakopane, I will try to uh, I, will, I will try to characterize based on some on their background. Uh, the dynamic development of the night economy in Krakow has been observed since the beginning of the 21st century. The, the intensification of that process was uh, contributed by the city's tourism, uh, city's tourism revival, resulting from the rapid improvement in its transport accessibility, mainly by air with, with low, low cost uh, airlines, and the development of the accommodation based also uh, connected with the sharing economy concept. Development of the uh, night economy in Krakow was visible mainly uh, in the rapid increase of the number of entities in the catering and entertainment sector operating during the evening and night. The recipients of these premises were both 
young uh, residents and students temporarily studying in the city, as well as tourists. The city's nights offer is still mainly based on so-called uh, simple entertainment, which large, largely corresponds to the low price. The excess of tourists, problem of over-tourism, alcoholization of night, which ha uh, had its peak in 2018 and 2019, so just before COVID pandemic, gave rise to dissatisfaction and verbal disapproval among uh, Krakowian, Krakowian residents. Zakopane, on the other hand, is the city associated with the mountains, with the peace, the nature, hiking, but also Piedmont recreation. The city is called the winter capital of, uh, uh, of Poland. It has well-developed private accommodation facilities, but also stands it with its night offer. Contrary to other mountain Carpathian resorts in Poland, only Zakopane has the reputation of a place where something is happening at night. In Zakopane, it is said that uh, this is the only city in the Tatra mountains that lives after that lives after 8 p.m. Slovak Tatra villages die after 8 p.m. So it is very visible among uh, tourists uh, from the east that they are uh, taking Zakopane as their tourism destination en masse. Uh, hence, in uh, minds of Poles and some foreign guests, Zakopane is the has the, that image uh, of city living at night uh, with well-developed uh, uh, nighttime uh, uh, economy uh, sector. Uh, changes in the temporal availability of nighttime facilities uh, were the results of legal restrictions introduced in Poland to prevent spreading the COVID. Some sectors like gastronomy may have existed through the pandemic, but only for takeaway and delivery. They were not shut down. They could operate, but, uh, uh, but we couldn't meet inside uh, the, the facility. We had to take out or deliver our food. Uh, other sectors like uh, uh, discos, mass events, they were uh, closed to March 2020 completely. In the first phase of the pandemic, in order to disperse people, many grocery stores, including chain stores like Tesco, uh, they uh, decided to operate 24 hours a day. Uh, these were only the facilities that benefited from the night. They ex extended their working hours. As a result, longer opening hours remain, with the 20, but uh, the 24-hour model was abandoned. The restrictions implied changes in the transportation system. Public transport, both in Krakow and partially also in Zakopane, was significantly reduced. Uh, mm, mm, there was not only a restriction of available places in vehicles, but also working hours were shortened. Uh, so the night become unavailable for people for, uh, who are using a public transport. Paradoxically, in large cities, the transport gap was filled by scooters, which were uh, perceived as very safe mode of transport. The cities were also darkened. Krakow city lights were turned off in the streets after 10 p.m. as a cost-saving measure. Uh, the pandemic ban, regulations, lockdowns were initially accepted by the society indisputably, but uh, some of them, after a while, started to uh, raise yet resistant. Uh, so the first stage of the gradual lifting up the restrictions affecting entrepreneurs began in April, already in April, when the rigors of the operation of commercial and service outlets were partially eased. It was the, the response to that resistance on the lockdowns. Also, the numbers improved. Uh, the second stage was already in May. Uh, the, gener the, the general ban of operating shopping centers ceased to apply, and hotels and other accommodation facilities were opened back for unlimited number of guests. The third stage covered, first of all, the launch of sanitary gastronomy uh, 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 requirements with certain uh, uh, with a certain number of people inside the uh, inside the the facility. Uh, but already at the end of the May, the number of guests who, who can stay in the restaurants uh, 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 were eased. Uh, however, the condition for running a gastronomic activity was ensured to, to, uh, with the obligation to cover the face and mouth until people were uh, seated. Also, in line of that 
stages of the frosting after the first lockdown, uh, nighttime economies facilities started to be unlocked. Uh, the holiday season, so June, July, August, and the part of the September brought a certain revival in the functioning of nighttime economy in the city. What is worth to underline? Uh, by March 2021, there was probably no complete frostbite in any of the sectors. Everything worked, worked for half of seats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we uh, on this uh, on the graph we can see on this table we can see the months where particular sectors of nighttime economies were completely closed, or partially defrosting but not completely. Uh, but uh, October came and the increase of the number of infections uh, has led to the return of the restrictions aimed at stopping the spread of the COVID. And it immediately again faced the resistance. Uh, in the first place, restrictions in the economic sphere affected the fitness, catering industry, swimming pools, water parks, gyms, clubs, and fitness centers. Restaurants and other establishments came back to the mode of selling food for delivery on or, or takeout. Uh, and uh, um, discos and uh, nightclubs were completely banned again. Exhibition, congresses, conferences, they could only be held through online. And uh, from the November already, uh, this, uh, there was a very strict ban on inviting people to accommodation facilities like hotels. Only people who were traveling for business uh, purposes were allowed to use the hotel, uh, the hotel, uh, hotel facilities. Uh, this is uh, this is the graph that presenting the phases, the four, five phases, uh, mm, 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 describing the resistance to the restrictions. Uh, since phase one, where was the total lockdown, till phase four and B, where we uh, were observing uh, not only the protests against the uh, lockdown, lockdown measurements, but actually it was it would, would be called it might be called also a revolution. Uh, the ch uh, changes in demand. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry because I went to yeah. Changes in demand behavior require a small look at nine type uh, users. Attention will be focused on the resident students and tourists. First significant change and in the same time difference between Krakow and Zakopane is the different audience of nighttime economy during the pandemic. In Krakow, for example, there are only locals and temporary residents like foreign students, foreigners working in a co corporations. In the pandemic, external visitors completely disappeared. The town began acting only for residents. In Zakopane, residents were not playing the, uh, the main role in the nighttime economy sector. So what happened? residents started to uh, act like uh, they are trying to attract tourists. And uh, the activities of this sector appeared only with the influx of guests, mainly domestic tourists. Initially, Zakipane was visited for one day, then for weekends, longer holidays. Of course, winter bans introduced were completely avoided in various ways because of very particular uh, cultural context of the Carpathian Mountains and the Tatra Mountains. It's like uh, this, uh, the base, the, the, the accommodation base in Zakopane is a private sector. It's a totally private sector uh, and it's private accommodation base. So everyone, every tourist who was traveling to Zakopane was coming to visit a family. That's why they can stay uh, in accommodation base. What is more, what is more, uh, uh, they uh, were coming for business to visit family and friends, and uh, they were uh, operating also in a. Uh, they were using a private camper van, so no one could could uh, accuse them of uh, uh, breaking the law. Uh, observing the actual activity of the society of the, um, to the restrictions and reviewing the activities I'm the, at the reopening of nighttime economy during COVID, we need to underline that in summer, when the restrictions were eased, the residents of Sklakov split. One group was scared and avoided the nightlife others, especially young people, they were using the nightlife facilities as much as they could. What is more, during the uh, time, few new places from nighttime economy started to operate 
mainly in the open air. Uh, in Krakow and in Zakopane in summer, sport activity started to increase also at night among, among residents and domestic tourists who decided to travel and uh, spend their vacation there. In Zakopane, after the summer opening, nobody wanted to limit themselves. Uh, there was a very strong social uh, resistance. Uh, even signals, very vi visible signals of underground activity. The actions of state institutions were also not conducted to this pandemic. Uh, mm, uh, in Krakow and Zakopane, uh, mm, there, for the actions of residents were uh, influenced by the state uh, institutions who started to uh, acting in a way breaking the law. During the national quarantine, so it was it was December, Polish television was, lo was looking for extras to work as an audience, living audience for an outdoor event during the New Year Eve mass event. It wouldn't be controversial if in the same time the state introduced a curfew uh, uh, and a national quarantine, so people during that eve uh, were obliged to stay at homes without inviting new guests outside the household. Uh, this caused first maybe the confusion of, of uh, uh, society, but uh, uh, um, practically a very, a very big anger. Uh, Helen, I'm really sorry to interrupt, but uh, your time is already over. Yes, yeah. two, two, two last slides. Here we have some examples of that resistance. Uh, uh, strike of entrepreneurs, especially owners of clubs and discos, who filed lawsuit to check whether the business bans were legally introduced in, the, in Poland. Uh, the court actually ruled that companies cannot be prohibited from operating under the ordinance without introducing uh, an, a, a state of emergency in Poland, which was never introduced. Uh, in Zakopane, we have even uh, an example on the first picture about, on, the, on the top of the, of the slide that in one night in February, people started to, uh, to dance and have fun on the street without taking any measurements of social contact and even taking a mask. Uh, in Krakow, for example, gyms, uh, gyms started to operate as a stores uh, where you can come, when people can come and uh, check uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sport equipment there. So they were not operating as a gyms, but as a stores where you can try if that particular equipment fits for you. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, um, I really think we have to move on to the next presentation, otherwise we will not have time to discuss since we still have two and each one. So yes, I would ju just only like to underline that uh, uh, that's that faces uh, where uh, nighttime economy facilities went through during the pandemic. It was from ac acceptance till the complete rage. And uh, uh, looking back to what happened in nighttime economic sector till March, we, we are actually eager to say that this sector showed the greatest resistance in Polish conditions because it started to work again after March 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm really sorry, but no, it's uh, good. really <laughs> insightful. And we can get back to some of the points uh, in the questions. Yes. So now I'd like to move on to Zhao with uh, also interesting insights uh, from two corners of the world, London and Shanghai. Uh, Thank you. Zhao, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Miguel. Let me just share my screen. Okay. okay. Can you all see my yes. one point? Okay, good. Okay. Um, yeah. And thanks, Alicia, Bing, and Magdalena, Magdalena for sharing their amazing project. Um, my name is Jiao Wei Zhao. I just entered my third year of PhD study in King's College London. I'm currently in the middle of my fieldwork, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to present my project. Well, um, so my project is about exploring night markets in London and Shanghai in the era of COVID-19. So um, night markets have a long history since Han Dynasty in China, and they are interesting places that are important to our nocturnal experience. 
So among many other ways of formatting markets, night markets are nocturnal events where street vendors sell food and a range of other products varying from clothing to antiques. And a number of night markets now open as temporary events. They can be daily, weekly, seasonally, and even one-off, and they can vary in different geographic scales. More importantly, night markets orient more towards cultural consumption and, and leisure. So in today's presentation, I will be mainly talk, talking about my research questions, the true review methodology of the project to give you a sense of what is it about, and also some initial findings. So first, so first, the aim of the project is to explore the ways night markets constructing nightlife in two cities. And in taking these two cities as case studies, it offers a cross-cultural com comparison on different ways, different cultures and local policies, practices, social exchange and cultural activities contribute to our understandings of nighttime cities and nightlife beyond the narrow concerns of economics. So here are my research questions. So the central question is how do night markets restructure urban nightlife in underused land? Now, having looked at my research aim and questions, let's move on to research context. So there are three main bodies of literature that I have done so far. History of night markets, urban night, regeneration and gentrification. So I reviewed part of the history of night markets, not a full history because there is a gap on history of night markets in two cities. What, I, what I'm trying to do here is to understand the historical background of night markets and different historical understanding and people may hold for night markets. So the phenomenon of night markets has followed Chinese migration, first to Southeast Asia, particular Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and more recently to Western countries. So previous studies on contemporary night markets generally concentrated in Southeast Asia. And such studies highlight some of the economic value of night markets. But more recently, Western scholars noticed the trend of Asian style night markets featuring with Asian vendors, Asian food, Asian decorations, consumers, and in Western cities. As Shaw observes that East Asia's night markets have been repackaged for Western consumers and ver versions of them now even tour around the world. So that's the first part of my literature. Then I introduced nocturnalization as a way that shifted the daily life rhythm in the 19th century. And the process of nocturnalization facilitates the development of night markets in several ways. Then I focus more on contemporary series about overnight meaning, cultural understanding of the night, different forms of urban nightlife spaces, regulation of such spaces, the idea of nighttime economy, and the development of nighttime economy policies in two cities. And finally, I looked at ways night markets as temporary use of space in relation to urban regeneration and gentrification. So temporary use of space are one of cultural led redevelopment strategies. They are powerful ways to, re to frame, humanize and control the space. So night markets in both cities occupy different forms of disused land that fit into this context. And regeneration and gentrification are part of the framing reason which makes particular spaces regeneration, regenerated for night markets. Okay, let's turn to the next part, methodology. First, this study I for this study I choose two night markets in London and two 
night markets in Shanghai. In London, I chose I chose two examples. So first, Vinegar Yard is a mixed use or meanwhile operation of food, beverage, and retail. It's the test bed for a permanent scheme. And for Gato Metropolitano, it's an Italian style one. And it occupies a disused paper factory. In Shanghai, night market, two night markets selected are government projects. And so here are the two that I'm going to look at, Green Escape and Seoul Night Market. Green Escape is a temporary pedestrian street market, and Seoul Night Market is a Korean-style one. It's an outdoor, space, outdoor street market as well. So the main research method of this project is ethnography. Ethnography is a research method as well as a written product of ethnography research. It allows me to immerse myself in night markets as a customer and being part of the community to gain in-depth some understandings of people's experience of night markets. And this methodology is also guided by the actor network theory, which suggests that the social is not a special domain of reality, but it's also defined as a very peculiar movement of reassociation and reassembling. So guided by the ANT theory, I will not only look at human being interactions, but also practices and interactions between human and non-human materials. So Participant observation is the key method of data collection here. Um, night markets are complex social spaces. By in employing this method, I can be a customer, experience the nightlife, observing and study the assembly. So beside, I also use secondary data, secondary doc document, semi-structured interviews and visual method to collect the data from Multi, multiple perspectives. So finally, here are some very initial findings from my uh, data collection in Shanghai because I just started field work in London this month. So um, first, it's, it's a bit unexpected, but also reasonable to find out how deeply the pandemic has been affecting night markets in Shanghai. Well, taking policy as an example, you might know that China's border is still closed due to the strict pandemic prevention policies. So therefore a lot of, a large number of people are unable to travel abroad when local governments now are promoting domestic tourism. Night markets are benefiting from this. For example, uh, Seoul Night Market in Shanghai has this iconic slogan they say that you don't have to travel to Korea. You can enjoy Korea culture right here in Shanghai. And this works really well and people are buying it. Another example is that the street stall and small store economy, which was published right after the national lockdown in 2020, it encourages people to set up stalls in cities, but only in certain areas then the night markets become where most vendors went. The most common answer I get from interview questions, why did you join this night market? Is because of the pandemic. And there are a lot of issues you need to unpack in future data analysis. The second one I'd like to share is traditional night, bottom-up night markets were replaced by top-down top ones. So, it has many implications here. For example, planners try to regulate night markets as a kind of formal economy by, by assigning fixed stores, locations, and certificates to them, which endangers the flexibility of street vending. But what I want to emphasize here is that some traditional street food that truly represents Shanghai is disappearing and replacing by um, more fusion food. Food, it, actually food is believed to be the soul of a good night market in China. And street food is a way 
that we get to know people. And you can get cheap and at the same time delicious food in night markets. You can have like more than 30 choices of food every day. But now food in night markets are as expensive as six shed, as far as from my observation. So in a country that is famous for food culture, traditional craftsmanship in night markets is not being valued enough. And the last one I'd like to briefly mention is that with the increasing dependence on social media marketing, night markets in Shanghai are catering to the young generation more than ever. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Sal. Really interesting. Uh, to look at uh, maybe not so explored topic within the nighttime economy. And the last presentation uh, is from colleagues in Milan, Luigi Carboni and Fabio Manfredini. Uh, and then I ask you to keep it short and we can still have uh, five to 10 minutes of questions at the end. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'm gonna share my screen. And um, yes, I think. Do you see? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Okay, perfect. I try to <laughs> be very short and sensitive as possible. Um, I'm going to present uh, this research um, together and also on behalf of my colleague, Fabio Manfredini. And we work uh, in the Department of Architecture and Urban Planning and Urban Studies in Politecnico di Milano. And our research focus for this presentation has been the, to map and to uh, research night like activities in the city of Milan, um, exploring uh, this phenomena using mobile phone data. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, starting from our let's say, research question and also our methodology, what we try to do is to, uh, in urban studies, also it's very relevant to map to explore the spatial distribution of night activities, um, but also um, related to this kind of economies also is very important to uh, look at the temporal distrib distribution. Um, therefore, we use um, mobile, mobile phone data um, in order to, let's say, um, explore the presences of people during the pre-pandemic and also the pandemic uh, period in Milan. Here are some of the activities that we carry on for achieving this, uh, let's say, research. And we, we start, as I said, mapping the presences of uh, people in Milan neighborhoods uh, during the different periods of uh, pre and during pandemics, also to, to see the differences in uh, behaviors and mobilities of residents and people within uh, the city. Um, then we compare the curves and the trends of uh, the urban scale uh, for each uh, for different neighborhoods and also we try to investigate uh, therefore the behaviors and the activity of uh, the behaviors of people and also the activities uh, that uh, may be relevant at night and finally provide information of these uh, variables, uh, variables and finally also we try to integrate uh, these uh, uh, fundings with uh, the distribution of the basic services uh, uh, open at night. Let's say that this, um, this, oops, sorry. Uh, this research um, focuses on the potential of um, mobile phone data in, in reading the practices and the rhythm of people in the use of the city, which is not provided by standard data, by more um, um, uh, by geographical data. Therefore, we see this third dimension which is very a new represent a new challenge in the urban study of the temporal variability of, um, of the presence of people. Um, just a, a small introduction related to the available data sets in order to understand which kind of data we are working with. Uh, we are working with presences, um, which are uh, the estimation of the quantity of people and presences detected in a specific geographical area. In this sense, is a Arche, our statistical unit uh, which represent the districts in Milan. And also this data represent, in, represents different social demographic uh, characteristics of the population, such as males, females, business. Uh, however, in this um, stage of the research, we didn't have the possibility to um, sorry. 
sorry, I miss, uh, this is a comment. Um, we didn't have the time to um, let's explore these details of the data, but for further steps, for sure, is a uh, an important uh, characteristic of the data that can be used for understanding like activities in uh, in the micro scale. Um, these data were acquired as part of activity of the Department of Food Planning, in particular uh, the excellent project of territorial fragility, which is a, a project carried on in the Department of Urban Planning, which we are able to let's say uh, acquire this uh, important uh, mobile phone data from team which is one of the most uh, important company of uh, mobile uh, phone in italy the temporality as a very important factor is already said of this data is a very high temporal resolution 15 minutes for a period of uh, 15 months which allows us to study the precondition of the pandemic and also the period of the lockdown and pandemic and these are based on significant sample of the population and also the, the data, of course, um, are integrated with, uh, say, with, uh, need to be integrated with more conventional data, but um, we will see in the following slides. Um, a very important uh, characteristic as, um, of the of mobile phone data is that um, this data set can overcome the limitation in particular for urban studies in detecting let's say um, urban phenomena uh, which um, standard uh, data cannot detect such as uh, i don't know like um, uh, inf providing information of the temporary population uh, of the population at night in the in the urban areas and also represent a very a potential challenge um, compared to more traditional uh, survey methods. Here we have just a comparison between conventional data that may be uh, used, uh, can use in Milan, for example, statistical data. I don't know if you, oops, if you maybe have the chat. Uh, statistical data and um, related to the census, but here we can see the division in Milan of the different uh, archer, the, as I was saying, statistical units also where the telephone, the mobile phone data are available for um, being used. And also we have more standard cartographic data, uh, such as facility services, but also we investigate also um, um, major attractors, and of course, night, uh, night economies. Um, and, Unfortunately, of course, these data have a different uh, uh, frequency in being updated, and for ACE is an annual update, um, is an annual uh, currency. Mobile phone data, on the other hand, are simple of users, uh, team users, uh, with social demographic information, as I said before, and with a very high and relevant temporal and spatial uh, resolution of the neighbor scale and also available for a period of 15 months between 2019 and 2020. Uh, just for um, a brief introduction about the context where we are working with, of course, the city of Milan. Uh, it's, a, uh, of course, a huge attractor for uh, all the economies in the province of Milano, of Milan, and also a very high, dense and populated city uh, all over Italy. Um, we can see that the distribution of the population is very different from we have a high uh, most populated district both in the city center close to the city center but also uh, in the more outskirt part of the city and we can see that this uh, fundamental attractor for uh, different economies for recreational activity and for the nightlife in particular here just a division of the archer which will be the scale of the investigation of our research Let's jump to, let's say, start uh, working with this temporal data and try to uh, understand the different patterns and variability of presence along the city of Milan. Here we can see a graph that compares the pre-lockdown situation and the lockdown in the two, uh, in two months selected, March and April. In blue, we can see uh, which were the, the, the presence curves, curves in, uh, in the pre-lockdown situation. We can, we can detect different trends such as for example per hour we can see the difference between the week and the weekend 
the night and the day. So we can start seeing all the different trends um, per hour, the, the difference between working day and weekend, the holidays here, for example, we have the period of Easter where we can see the presence decreasing strongly and then coming up after the holidays are finished. And also we can detect the lockdown effect where presences are way more, are lower and also the difference between night and day activities is uh, um, less evident. And finally, we can detect the overall presence, number of presence um, for each uh, hour. Here is a um, more detailed analysis based on the curves of a simple week in April. And again, we can, we can appreciate the difference between the date and night in Milan. So in a city which uh, have a strong um, work, uh, working, um, like presence is based on working reason and also some trends that goes down during the weekend and during uh, the Saturday and Sunday days. And then we try to, let's say, uh, with the conventional data, we try to map the distribution of, uh, of the actual distribution of these uh, night activities at the economies. Uh, and as a starting point uh, of, uh, for uh, trying to, 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 to show, to display the complexity of this type of, uh, of phenomenon activities, which we can see from this map is very articulated and complex uh, in spatial distribution in Milan. We have a very uh, dense uh, city center, but also we can see some radius that goes up and down uh, along the most important infrastructural uh, uh, roads. And we can appreciate therefore the distribution of different bars, restaurants, um, in overall the night activities that we um, we selected for trying to um, represent uh, these uh, services. Then what we um, we try to do in terms of uh, understanding the patterns of the night activities uh, for uh, for Milan, we decided to classify the urban spaces according to their, um, let's say, night activity, um, putting relation the night and day <clears throat> and day presences for uh, all the districts. And what we can appreciate from this map is that um, uh, in red we have uh, these uh, neighborhoods where night activities are uh, higher than daily uh, presences. Um, this might, uh, let's say, under, under, underline or neighborhood where districts uh, are more attractive by night compared maybe uh, than during the day. We have, of course, some more known neighbors such as Navigli or uh, Porta Genova, but also some uh, neighborhood in the outskirts of the city, which are not uh, detectable as we've seen in the images before from conventional data. Uh, here, the same information where we can start recognizing some clusters of uh, districts where that works in, in attracting uh, people uh, during the night. And we did the same for, uh, let's say, also understanding the late night districts. So this is that attract people maybe for, um, for the nightlife. Um, we can see here another very interesting pattern, uh, completely different from, from the one before, where we can understand some, which are the most, um, let's say, uh, attractive neighborhood in the late night during, uh, uh, let's say, a period of uh, in three in the morning to six in the night. And also we can uh, understand some residential district. We can see some really cluster of residential district, or even, let's say, we can say dormitory where people move to um, uh, during the night. So to conclude here, just some curves where we can appreciate the pre-lockdown and post-lockdown differences, where the difference between day and night are uh, in the red curves we can see, it's not relevant. This uh, represents the um, immobility uh, of people during the lockdown and pandemic. And to conclude, supportation and critical points. Of course, night nice studies represents a very important uh, topic for urban studies, which is a new topic need to uh, can be explored uh, as a research. The data are versatile and their self can lead to very uh, interesting spatial uh, cluster and distribution of the 
of the presences uh, of people in the in the city. And of course, we need further exploration that can consider also demographic profiles of the team users and also integration with more statistical and also conventional data. Some critical point, of course, uh, this is just an experiment that we try to uh, carry on on a sample of data and this needs further exploration and also the complexity of the interpretation of this data also in being communicated. And thank you for the attention. I think I can conclude here. Thank you, Luigi.